Whew, man, I'm a wreck. Oh, happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, those of you who are joining us online, welcome. Uh, hope that you're having a, an amazing Easter. We're in the message, we're in a, a series of messages that uh, we started off last weekend uh, called Overwhelmed. And uh, last week we talked about um, feeling overwhelmed by anxiety because uh, I find that um, as, even as I just talk to people and, and even as I just talk to myself, uh, we many times just feel overwhelmed in our, in our day today. Um, Overwhelmed by anxiety, overwhelmed by fear, overwhelmed by loneliness, all of those different things. Next week, we're going to talk about being overwhelmed uh, by loneliness. And uh, as I was reading through the, the, the scriptures this, this week, um, as we're going through like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because go figure, like every Easter, you know, like what, what am I going to preach on? Well, obviously, I know what I'm going to preach on. Um, I'm preaching on the resurrection of Jesus. But I'm, as I was reading through it, and I'm thinking about this whole series of, of just feeling overwhelmed. Um, I, I noticed something that every person in the first Easter story, in the first first Easter morning, as in all of the accounts, you can read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, they were all overwhelmed. Um, but the interesting thing is that they, they weren't overwhelmed in the way that you would think that they would be overwhelmed. You would think that they'd be overwhelmed with joy. Like you'd think that they'd be like, I told you so, take that devil. You know, you think that they would just be like, hoorah, you know, just excited, like over, overwhelmed with just happiness and joy and just freaking out. Oh my gosh, he's risen. You'd think that like as every person is like seeing the risen Christ or seeing the empty tomb and they're going back and they're running back to tell the disciples and the townspeople, they're like, he is risen. You'd think everybody would be like, he is risen indeed, right? Just like good Christians. Like we have that kind of responsorial thing that we got going on, right? Like he is risen, he is risen indeed. But that's not how it happened. It's simply not how it happened. Like nobody was outside the tomb on Easter morning holding a sunrise service. Nobody. They were, there was no countdown. There's no, there wasn't a bunch of like faith-filled disciples waiting through the night, you know, doing a watch night service, being like, five, four, three, roll that stone. There was none of that. None of this, none of this happened. None of it. Nobody expected it. It's just not how it happened. Even though Jesus had told his disciples numerous times and on numerous occasions, hey guys, listen, look, come here, gather around. I want you to know things aren't going to go that well for me. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be killed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rise from the dead three days later. Even though he had told them this numerous times, and we read that throughout scripture, they were still confused, afraid, weeping, distraught, and doubting. Literally, nobody was expecting the resurrection that morning. And you can read it for yourself. Honestly, Easter, the first Easter, was the day nobody seemed to believe. The disciples, the women, like all of these people that were following Jesus, nobody was expecting this day to happen. It was a day where people were overwhelmed with doubt. And so you can read in, in the book of John, if you've got your Bibles, John chapter 20. Um, there's the, the begins, the whole, the whole beginning of John chapter 20 is like Mary Magdalene as she's distraught and, and weeping and she goes to the tomb early. And uh, she's the tomb, she finds that the tomb is empty and she starts freaking out. You don't have to show that now, I'm not reading it. And uh, she starts frantically running around about telling the disciples, you know, she's like, oh my goodness, like the, the, the tomb is empty. But I want you to understand when Mary seems, sees the tomb empty and she runs back to tell the disciples, she's not saying to them, guys, oh my goodness, Jesus rose from the dead. That's not the story. Her story is, oh my goodness, somebody stole the body. And not only does she not believe that Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples don't even believe her. They're like, oh, that's nonsense, come on. This, they don't even believe her story. And so you got two guys, Peter and John, who start running to see the tomb for themselves. And they get there, and sure enough, they figure out, they walk in, and the, the stone was rolled away. They walk in, and sure enough, yep, Mary wasn't lying. It's true. It looks like somebody must have stolen the body. 
They're, they're not thinking, this would be a great time. If, if you were just like making up this story, like if you're just like, you know, we're going to pen this story so that like people that read this story are going to believe and know that they know that they know that this actually happened. This would be a great time for the Peter and John to, to walk into the, the empty tomb and see the, you know, all the things all neatly like stacked and all that. And they think, oh, this is it. This is what Jesus said was going to happen. He's going to, oh my gosh, it's three days later. What were we not thinking? Like, yes, of course, Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. This would be a good time for them to, re- but that's not, that's not what happens. That's not what happens. So what do they decide to do? Peter and John are standing there. It's almost awkward if you read it for yourself in the book of John. What do you think they did? They, you think that they started singing, because he lives, I can faith. No. no. These two guys decide to go back home for lunch. That's how ridiculous this story is. Nobody was expecting, even in the face of the empty tomb, that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. So they leave. They're like, well, I guess we'll just kind of I don't see him around here, so I guess we'll, we'll go back home for lunch. Mary Magdalene is still distraught. She's, she just waits by the tomb crying hysterically by herself. They don't even wait for her. And the risen Jesus shows up standing right in front of Mary Magdalene. And she is so wrecked with grief that she thinks he's the gardener. She starts talking to Jesus, and she's like, excuse me, sir, uh, excuse me, yeah, could... Could, do you, have you seen Jesus? Do you know what they did with the body? Did you see, if you saw something, say something. Like, you know, she's like very concerned that maybe he might have seen some foul play happening. And Jesus has to literally look at Mary. I almost imagine that he kind of like took her by the face as she's crying and asking all these frantic questions. And he just says, Mary. And it was at that moment when he calls out her name. Because it's always that moment when he calls out your name that she just re- realizes, oh my goodness, this is Jesus standing right in front of me and I knew it not. And she realizes that they have a conversation and then she runs back to the disciples who were just getting eating lunch. They just get gotten back and she's like, I have seen the Lord. And it's at that moment where we're going to pick up our story in John chapter 20. We're going to start off in verse 19. Would you mind standing with me as we uh, honor the reading of God's word this morning? Verse 19, John 20. On the evening of the first day of that week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them as well. And he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I want you to notice something really quickly. Notice that it wasn't until they personally encountered Jesus for themselves that they moved from being overwhelmed to being overjoyed. Verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, which I would go by Thomas as well. (laughs) one One of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Uh -uh. unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails used to be and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was now with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
Lord, we thank you for your word. I thank you for Resurrection Sunday. I thank you for the reminder that all of these people were overwhelmed with doubt. And even in the midst of their doubting, you show up and surprise them. I pray you'd surprise each and every single one of us today on this Easter morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. So, so John tells Thomas's story, which is kind of a, a, a bit of a tragic one. Kind of the he kind of missed out on, on some big deals, right? And right right before he uh, he tells the story, and then he goes on, and, and I'm going to read these last two sentences of John chapter 20 because he kind of gives like a thesis statement for why he writes his gospel. He tells the story of Thomas, and then he says in verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these stories are written that you, who's he talking about? He's talking about you. That you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen? In other words, one of the reasons that John wrote this gospel was to record the stories of people just like you who didn't believe but who came to believe so that you would come to believe even in your unbelief. That's, that's part of the reason why he wrote his whole gospel was for people just like you. One of the most freeing things that we can learn from the first Easter is that you can have faith even in your doubting. That's the beauty of the faith that Christ calls us to, that we can, we can have faith even, even when we don't understand it, even when we don't understand what in the world or how in the world or we didn't expect it and we're completely surprised and we're, we're left flat-footed in the face of, of Christ. Like, you can have faith even in your doubting. And so all of the disciples are gathered, except for Thomas. We don't know what happened to Thomas. Maybe he was like taking a run for takeout, you know, and I, I, have, I have no idea. We, we, we don't know why he wasn't there. Maybe he just was tired that night, didn't come to the prayer meeting. It was a big prayer meeting. He probably regretted it, right? Like, but he, he, just, he just missed it. Either way, Jesus shows up to the group of disciples that are there, and Thomas isn't. And Jesus talks with these disciples, and, and he shows them the nail marks in his hands and the spear mark in his side, and they're like overjoyed, they're freaking out, they're overwhelmed with excitement. And then Thomas comes strolling in from Market Basket and he's like, hey guys, what's going on? And it's the epitome of like, dude, you just missed it. You've been there before where you're like, are you kidding me? Like I always miss out on the cool stuff. Like, you know, we're just, and, and he comes strolling in and they're like, you, oh my goodness, dude, I, I can't even explain to you what you just missed. It was absolutely amazing. It says in verse 25, it says, the other disciples told him, clearly, they're like, we have seen the Lord. You, it was absolutely amazing. And they described how he came in through the wall. I don't even know. He just was there. He just showed up. The door was locked. It's still locked. And he just all of a sudden was there. But I want you to see how Thomas reacts. It says, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And I always thought like, Thomas, that's a bit morbid. Don't you ever think that? Like, dang, that's like intense. Like you, Really? Like that's you that's that's the that's the thing? You have to do that? Like that's ugh. maybe I'm just not good with blood and stuff, but like, come on, are you kidding me? But what I've come to think is this. I simply think that Thomas is just being honest. He's essentially saying, like, if I'm gonna risk my life for this thing, if I'm going to surrender all to this, I'm gonna need to see it for myself, boys. 
Like, I, I love your story, and I know I was at Market Basket getting you all food, and you had this amazing time with God, and that must have been awesome and great, but I just need you to know, like, I need to see it for myself. And it boils down to this question. It's the question that every single one of us should really wrestle with is this. Is what Thomas is asking for too much to ask for? Is it? I mean, wouldn't you need some sort of personal experience with Jesus before you gave your whole life to him? Especially if it meant risking your life, especially if it meant like as soon as you walk outside of the doors with all of these guys that are like, hoorah, Jesus is alive. Don't you think you'd need some personal experience to risk your life and go all in? I sure did. And my guess is that those of you who are followers of Jesus had to have some sort of, i got to come to the, the realization of my own. And I want us to all understand that these disciples became absolutely convinced of something that they were otherwise unconvinced of. Every single one of them were like, I don't know, these women are talking about Jesus being written in the empty tomb and I don't really know about all that. And it wasn't until they personally encountered Jesus Christ through the locked doors of their life that it changed everything for them. Everything was different. I want to just remind you that nobody dies a martyr's death unless they're sure that they're sure that they're sure that they're sure. So I think what Thomas is really saying is this. I desperately want to have a personal encounter with Jesus, just like you all did. Isn't that what, what doubting, doubting Thomas is looking for? Simply what everyone is looking for? I mean, if I'm going to be really honest with you, like, let me tell you something about myself. Like, if I had not encountered Jesus personally, I don't know if I'd believe you're like, but you're a pastor. I know. Like, I, I wouldn't. Let's just be honest, guys. Like, I mean, the story's great, and I know a lot of you. You got like stories of Jesus, and he showed up to you, and he speaks in your dreams and visions. And I just want you to know, like, if I hadn't personally encountered him myself, I don't know if I'd believe. My guess is it's probably no different for you. I think that what Thomas is asking for is exactly what every single one of us craves. Because now that I have, I'd be crazy to deny him. I would literally be crazy. Like, I, I, you'd have to put me in, I, I just like, I, I don't know. I'd like, I, I, since I've encountered Jesus in my life and I've seen him move in my life, I would be crazy to say, nah, I don't think it's real. I don't think it's, I think it's a, a sham. It's just kind of a propped up religion, man-made. See, I think Thomas gets a bad rap. We call him Doubting Thomas. I mean, imagine this dude gets like coined as Doubting Thomas for the rest of his life. Throughout, like We're all like, oh yeah, Doubting Thomas. And when you say things like that, don't be a Doubting Thomas. Like, honestly, this poor guy, like he just happened to be at Market Basket. You know, and he just, he just happened to not be there and he just wanted to have an experience just like all the rest of them. They were all doubting Thomas's, being like, okay, whatever. Oh yeah, sure, he rose from the dead, right? And they're all done. And then all of a sudden when Jesus shows up, they're like, oh my Lord. Literally, oh my Lord. Lord, and it's no different for them and it's no different for Thomas and it's no different for me and it's no different for you. I think Thomas gets a bad rap. He just wanted to have faith that was his faith. Not the faith of his friends, not the faith of the other disciples who happened to not be at Market Basket, not, not the friends of his mom, not, 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 the, not the faith of his grandmother. It had to be real to him. Why? Because if it was true, he was giving his whole life to it. I mean, if it was true, if, the, if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, if that was really true, man, and I put my hand and I did... It was over. I'm, I'm giving my whole life to I'm surrendering myself to this. Because when f faith that is your own is faith that you own. 
It's yours. It's not your mom's. It's not your grandma's. It's not your great great grandmother who was a who was a missionary. And it, listen, it is yours. And when it's yours, it's yours, and you own it. In verse twenty six, it goes on. It says, "Poor Thomas, he had to wait a week." All of them were like, "Oh my gosh!" And then Jesus said this, and then I put my hand in. And it says a week later. That's the longest week for Thomas, I bet. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. I bet he didn't leave. He's like, I ain't going for no more runs, no more food runs for me. Y'all go to Market Basket yourself, right? I'm sticking in the group, right? We'll, we'll do a door dash or something, but I ain't leaving, right? I don't know why he starts talking like a Massachusetts guy. I have no idea, but he did. It's in the Bible, right? <laughs> and he's like, He's like, he's in the room, which is, which is awesome. He, he's, he's like, no, I, I'm there. I'm not. And I don't know about you. Do you ever feel like you're the only person in the room that has doubts? Like everybody else in the room, like maybe you feel like that today where you're just like, man, I'm like, I'm in church. And all these people are like, hallelujah. And the preacher's up there. And you're like, yeah, and crying and all this stuff. And you're just like. Right? You're just like, I don't know. Like this is, y'all seem very excited about this. You know, I have some sort of experience that's happening in front of me, and I do, but I just, I just don't have that. I think, I think you'd be in good company with Thomas that week. As all of these guys, are this experience that he's wanting, that he's left waiting for, but he doesn't know how to get it. Thomas. It says that the doors were locked. I want to encourage you this morning. I really want to encourage you in this, that Jesus loves coming through the locked doors of your life. So you may be like, well, you just don't understand, Pastor Jeff. Like I got walls, the walls that are like this high and they're deep and they're wide. And I just want you to know like my past, you don't know where I've been, what I've done. You have no idea what's going on. You, and your heart is hard. And you're like, I did this and I tried this and it didn't work. I just want you to know when you invite him in, man, he just, he'll come through doors. He'll come through walls so thick you think nobody can get through. He loves to walk through walls in your life. That is what our Savior does. He loves to surprise you and show up when you least expect him. In the midst of your grief, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your loss, in the midst of your addiction, in the midst of your sin, in the midst of your shame, he just walks right in. You're like, I didn't think you were allowed here because you're holy. And he says, I am here because I came to dispel the darkness. He loves to surprise you. Verse 26, it keeps going. It says, Jesus came in and he stood among them. And I love what he said to them. He said it a couple times, if you noticed. The first thing that Jesus, the risen Christ, says to people, he says this, peace be with you. Isn't it interesting that the first thing that Jesus offers us is the thing that we want, what we need the most in our life, peace. We're talking about being overwhelmed, right? Overwhelmed with anxiety, overwhelmed. We're just overwhelmed in life. It's only when we encounter the living Christ that all of a sudden we move from being overwhelmed to overjoyed. All of a sudden there's peace that he offers to calm the storms of our life. We are looking, whether we realize it or not, we're looking for peace that relieves our anxiety. We're looking for peace that quiets our minds. We're looking for peace that answers our doubts. And then Jesus looks specifically at Thomas it doesn't say he said his name, but I bet he did. He looks right at Thomas and he says to him, put your finger here. See my hands. See my, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus looks directly at Thomas, the one guy who wasn't in the room and offers no explanation. He simply offers him a revelation of who he is. Can I just say, I love that Jesus literally knows Thomas's doubts without him even needing to ask. He doesn't have to say, well, like, could I just, could I maybe just, can I do the thing I, I really like? Jesus says, you, come here, reach out your hand. Feel that. I want you, I want you to know, you can trust me. I am who I say that I am. That's the beauty of what Christ does. To every single one of us that have wrestled, wrought with, with doubt and insecurity of like, I just don't know. I'm just not sure. He says, trust me, I am who I say that I am. And I've realized something, that Jesus didn't show Thomas his wounds. 
he showed Thomas his scars. And there's a difference. You know there's a difference between a wound and a scar? A wound is something that is still painful, right? It hurts. But a scar? A scar is a wound that's healed. You know how I know that Jesus invited Thomas to inspect his scar rather than a wound? Because you never offer someone to poke your wound, do you? No, you a wound is something that you hide. A wound is something that you, that you bandage, that you, that you keep undercover, that you guard, that you favor. But scars are what tell people it's okay. There's life on the other side of your pain. There's life on the other side of your struggle. There's life on the other side of your abuse. There's life on the other side of your sin. There's life on the other side of your shame. Satan tried putting Jesus down, but he just couldn't hold him there. That's the beauty of the Easter story. Satan tried killing Jesus, but he just wouldn't stay down. He tried putting him in the grave, but what do we know? The grave couldn't hold him. That's the beauty of, of resurrection story. That Jesus didn't, didn't just show up. Think about this. When he shows up to the disciples, he doesn't just show up as like this long-haired Fabio model that's all perfect and he's like got his like this beautiful, like, brand new body looking all perfect and everything. He doesn't show up to them and he's like, what cross? What? What nails? You know? What whip? What crown of thorns? What scourging? Ah, I don't even know what you're talking about. He simply tells Thomas to touch his scars, and the scars told the story. He's essentially telling Thomas and everyone else, what held me doesn't hold me anymore. What hurt me doesn't hurt me anymore. Church, in our attempt to act and look like we have everything perfect and all together, some of y'all need to stop hiding your scars. Your scars tell stories. Do you know that? Your scars are proof that what hurt you didn't kill you. That's the beauty of a scar. Wait, your scars are proof that God can heal you. Your scars are proof that there is life on the other side of your pain. And some of you need to hear that if you're in the midst of it. That Satan may have tried to take you down, but he just couldn't keep you there. So don't hide your scars because they may be the key to unlocking someone else's faith. Your past may be a key to unlocking someone else's hope. Your story may be a testimony to unlock someone else's fears. So tell them your testimony. Tell them your struggle. Show them your scars. Because it's the power of God that what, what held you has no hold on you anymore. That God can take a wound and turn it into a scar. That he can take your mess and turn it into a message. That he can take a trial and turn it into a testimony. That he can take your past and make it proof that God still heals that your scars tell a story that an argument never will. That's the beauty of what happened with Thomas. Jesus didn't show up and argue him into the kingdom. He just said, look, take a look at my scars. Living proof that what held me doesn't hold me. Living proof that what hurt me didn't kill me. Like living proof of that. Your scars tell a story that an argument never will. And watch what Thomas says. Look how he responds in verse 28. He says, my Lord and my God. I want you to see the radical shift that happens as soon as he touches Jesus. Jesus had been risen for a while. It had been a week later since he had shown up to the disciples. Other people believed. All the people in the room believed but it became real and personal to Thomas right there, right then, in that room. It was in that moment that the unexplainable met the undeniable. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you, you know, you understand this, that you can fully believe even though you don't fully understand. Do you know that you don't have to necessarily get everything all figured out before you can fully believe? Like, you could fully believe, and yet be like, yeah, yeah, you know what? I just don't get it either. Isn't that weird? People are like, well, how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? You're like, I got no clue. <laughs> well, how can you believe? I just do. 
I can fully believe in Jesus and not know how many angels fit on the, pat, the, the, the head of a pin. I, I, it doesn't bother me. There's a lot of things I just don't know. And people will be like, well, you're a pastor. You should know these things. I'm like, yeah, I, just, I don't. Sorry. I just know one thing. I met him. He showed up. He walked through closed doors, locked, padlocked doors. He walked through walls in my life. I, that's all I know. He just showed up. And I'm like, my Lord and my God, I give you everything. You could just do that? Yeah. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. When you encounter the Lord, it just changes everything. Look, Easter was a day that changed everything, but I just need you to understand that it, it didn't change anything for Thomas until he personally encountered him himself. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of this day that we celebrate. In one sentence, Thomas is saying, I can no longer deny what I can't explain. And it's this revelation that every single one of these disciples had to come to on their own, one at a time, and so will you. Almost every single one of these guys died a martyr's death because they were unwilling to recant that they had encountered the risen Jesus. So I, I want you to know that they, they didn't become so willing to die just because they heard stories about Jesus being risen from the dead. Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? No, it was, it was only because Jesus just kept showing up all over the place. And every person who doubted became, it became undeniable to every person who met him. Let me read for you in ending this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 kind of gives a rundown of Jesus literally showing up all over the place. Verse 3, it says, For what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, also known as Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep, you should ask him. And then he appeared to James. And then to all the apostles. The risen Jesus just kept showing up all over the place. And he keeps showing up and people keep encountering him today, just like I have, just like many of you have. He showed up in your life and he showed up in mine. And when he does, everything changes. Why don't you stand with me? So they call the guy Doubting Thomas. I just want to give you a little history about Doubting Thomas. This is what historians say about this guy. It's commonly accepted that between 52 AD and 72 AD, Doubting Thomas, as he is so lovingly called, um, led an incredible evangelistic crusade in India and, and many of the Christians in Kerala, India, who we, many of you have been to India on our missions trips because we've had a long time um, partnership with India Gospel Ministries over in India, many of them actually track back their Christian community back to the preaching of Doubting Thomas. It's reported that Thomas died a martyr's death for his faith. He encountered the risen Jesus, and it changed everything for him. Everything. So I want to encourage you this morning, be more like Doubting Thomas. Seek after him. Bring your doubts and all. Invite him to come through the locked doors of your heart. And maybe you're here this morning and as we're going to enter into one last song. Maybe you're here this Easter morning and, and you... Maybe you didn't realize how much you had in common with all the disciples on Easter morning. You're like, huh, kind of feel like them. Yeah, you're in good company. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you didn't realize you were like in a place where, oh, I didn't have to have everything all figured out or understand everything in order to believe. I want to encourage you to invite Jesus through the locked door of your heart today. If you want to know him personally, 
I literally, and I've said this many times, it was the summer before my ninth grade year, this is how I came to faith in Christ. I literally said to my youth leader, I think you're crazy, but if you're not, and if this is true, then I want it. How do I get it? If I can really have a relationship with the creator of the universe, then who wouldn't want that? And she prayed with me. And I will say from that, that night on, my life's never been the same. Never been the same. So if you're in that place today, I just want to I just want to encourage you that just like that song that we sang, that the Father is welcoming, this is your homecoming. Like the opportunity for you to just say, you know what, I, I, I got a ton of doubts and I got a, a ton of fears and I feel overwhelmed with all of that. But if you're in a place where you're like, you know what, I, if it's true, then I invite Jesus through the locked doors of my heart today. Surprise me. I think that's fair. So just between you and the Lord, I just want to give you an opportunity. Between you and him, no, with, don't, don't worry about who's beside you, in front of you, behind you, beside you. Just between you and him, maybe just raise your hand and say, God, I, I hear you today. And if this is really true, then I, then I want it in my life. Right, right now, the Easter morning, what a, gr- what a better time for you to just say, like, God, if this is true, surprise me, overwhelm me with your presence today. Just between you and him, just raise your hand. Say, yep, that's me. It's between you and him. I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me if you're raising your hand with me. Just essentially, it's so simple. It's a prayer that I first prayed when I encountered the risen Christ for myself. Lord Jesus, you pray along with me, all of you. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and that I'm in need of a Savior. And I repent of my sin today. And I choose to believe, even though I have doubts, that you came, that you died, and that you rose again to give me more and better life. And so I receive it, this new life, today, on Easter morning. Lord, we thank you for those that prayed. I pray that that you would begin encountering them and encountering them and encountering them, that they wouldn't be able to escape your grace and your love. No matter what walls, no matter what locked doors are in front of them, Lord, I pray that you would continue to draw them by your grace and your love and your mercy. As we have one last song, if, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you right over here in this corner. You can just kind of make your way over there either during the song or right after. We have a Bible and some resources we'd love to just give you. Um, You can take those on your way. We'd love to pray with you. If you have a prayer need in any area of your life, we'd love to pray with you today. So as we end with this worship song, I just want to encourage you (laughs) that the Father is welcoming. This is your homecoming. Lord, we thank you for this Easter morning and we worship you with all that is within us. In your name we pray. Amen.